I hope they represent useful insights into what I regard as the art of scientific practice in parapsychology. They've shaped the kind of researcher I've become, and perhaps also explain some of the preoccupations and biases that I have. My first love is the scientific method. I first became interested in parapsychology when aged about 14, not through any powerful or vivid personal experiences, or through a family history of paranormal beliefs or practices, but by discovering scientific research on the subject. In the UK, a magazine was published called The Unexplained that promised to explore all sorts of fantastical phenomena, uh, from alien visitations to spontaneous human combustion. And these, unsurprisingly, were very attractive to a young boy with a sceptical disposition, but also a fairly rich imagination. These tales were sobering and reminding us how much there was still to learn about nature and the phenomena that it permits. However, I quickly became disillusioned by reports of investigations that ended with the conclusion that the phenomena remained a mystery being inexplicable in terms of current scientific principles. And so cocking a snook at the hubris of the scientific mainstream by demonstrating that it didn't, in fact, know everything. Surely demonstrating an anomaly was the beginning of the scientist's journey, rather than the end of it, indicating as it did the most potentially rewarding or revealing areas for future investigation. Other articles in the magazine were more measured in tone. Particularly, I recall those highlighting Ed Cox's mini-lab experiments and Carl Sargent's Gansfeld studies at Cambridge. And these adhered more recognizably to scientific methods that might be superficially less exciting, make slower progress and report only modest gains, but ultimately may be more satisfying in providing trustworthy accounts of how things really are. So, aged 14, I determined to become a parapsychologist. How difficult could that be? <laughs> a few years later, I was completing my pre-university studies in physics, chemistry and biology, and was trying to decide which universities to apply to when my careers advisor mentioned that a new professor of parapsychology had just been appointed at Edinburgh University. Well, I can recognize an omen when I see one, and so it was that I was accepted to study biological sciences, uh, majoring in psychology at Edinburgh. My education at that point was wholly in the natural sciences. It had turned me into a philosophically naive uh, researcher. I'd been taught that the scientific method was simply a process of disciplined observation that guarded against what Francis Bacon called the idols of the tribe, the cave, the marketplace, and the theater. That is, the ways in which we might deceive ourselves when making observations and when drawing inferences about those observations. From that perspective, nature might seem inscrutable, but would give up its secrets with appropriate effort and diligence on my part. Science was a process of increasing exactitude, particularly in measurement, and all meaningful properties of the world could be measured objectively and consistently if we were careful enough. I was soon to discover the limits of this philosophy when I came to conduct my own research. I had a foretaste of things to come when I included in my undergraduate studies um, uh, modules on philosophy and sociology of science with members of Edinburgh's influential science studies unit, including scholars like Barry Barnes, Steve Shapin, and David Bloor. And this had a huge influence on me. I was introduced to the notion that even in the natural sciences, scientific knowledge can be a function of its social and political context. That the scientific elite is inherently conservative and suppressive. And that, in Thomas Kuhn's terms, scientific practice is only rarely edging towards revolution and is more commonly engaged in normal science, with its concomitant aggressive policing of the border between the, the legitimate and the illegitimate. The work of some of these philosophers and sociologists showed that for most of the mainstream, parapsychology lay on the wrong side of that border and was a victim of those processes. This perspective informed my undergraduate dissertation project which looked at how the quality ratings of the methodology of a parapsychology paper intended to simulate the journal review process depended not on the described method itself, but on whether the outcome and conclusions were congruent or incongruent with the assessor's own prior beliefs. In a classical instance of cognitive dissonance, participants were able to relieve tension brought about by being confronted with counter evidence by simply dismissing the evidence as invalid. I replicated the effect with students from St Andrews University and published the results in the British Journal of Psychology, still my only publication in the flagship journal of the British Psychological Society. This work drove home to me the extent to which people use their rational faculties for post facto justification rather than for genuine decision making, and made the Jonathan Swift quotation, it is useful to, uh, useless to attempt to reason a man out of a thing he was never reasoned into, one of my reference points. In my election statement for PA president, I mentioned that I thought we spent too much time and energy engaging with skeptics whose reputations are too strongly associated with the counter-advocate position for there to be any prospect of realistic movement from them, whatever the quality of the methods or data that we present. 
It's interesting to note, for example, that the substantive arguments offered by Ray Hyman and James Alcock in Krippner and Friedman's 2010 book, Debating Psychic Experience, are essentially the same as the positions they held in the 1980s and 1990s in books such as The Elusive Quarry and Science and Supernature, respectively. That intransigence in the face of quite significant shifts in the methods and evidence base for parapsychology suggests, to me at least, a preference for rhetoric over genuine engagement with the field. It seems that little has changed since Charles Onerton's damning critique of the, quote, impoverished state of skepticism, which remains one of uh, the most incisive criticism of the counter-advocate position. I'm not recommending that we ignore our skeptical colleagues, but that we're clear in what we're aiming to achieve when we do um, respond to them. So, for example, in 2010, I wrote a rejoinder for the Skeptic magazine to an article by Ray Hyman, in which he asked the leading question, is parapsychology dead or alive? And I've appeared regularly with Chris French in the UK to discuss parapsychological claims before public audiences, including in 2014 as part of a panel debate with him and Richard Wiseman on the supposed crisis in psychology and parapsychology. This was at the UK Skeptics Conference, attended by perhaps twice as many people as we have at this conference. My objective in each of these encounters was not, of course, to facilitate a shift in the skeptics' position, but to speak through them to a broader audience, some of whose opinions hopefully had not yet ossified, providing them with a more balanced picture of parapsychology's discoveries and emphasising that its practice was scientific business as usual. Given the virulent way in which uh, the Wikipedia entries on parapsychology are mismanaged, we have a difficult but important task ahead in ensuring that interested but discriminating members of the public can get access to accurate and balanced information about the state of the field. I went on to study for a PhD at the Kersler Parapsychology Unit, and my research topic reflected the unit's emphasis on cross-disciplinary approaches and on determining what looks psychic but isn't. This was in order to better sort the wheat from the chaff. I explored the technique of cold reading by getting access to a set of arcane publications that represent how-to guides uh, for would-be pseudopsychics, and by spending time with a practitioner who'd been working the circuit for over 30 years. Malcolm agreed to give readings to people he'd never met before. The clients were asked to rate the accuracy of the readings and to make a judgment as to the, whether we should study with him further in more formal research. Two of the three sitters were very impressed by their readings and gave unequivocal recommendations. We videotaped the interactions and Malcolm was filmed reviewing the recordings, pausing the tape at points to explain the stratagems that he'd been applying, using normal psychology to present as if he were truly psychic. In analysing Malcolm's account and synthesising the descriptions from cold reading manuals, it became obvious to me that the technique was actually a set of techniques that varied according to how much information leakage they required from the client and thus how specific the reading material could be. The more the leakage, the greater the specificity. This model argues strongly against the a heads I win tells you lose explanation offered by some skeptics, whereby unimpressive readings from mediums and psychics provide de facto evidence that psi does not occur, while impressive readings from mediums and psychics demonstrate the widespread use of cold reading and also so that, show that psi does not occur. The intention of the work was to show that we need to take into account the prevailing conditions when assessing whether material of the specificity observed could be achieved through cold reading alone. It's interesting to note here that explanations in terms of cold reading make some assumptions about client behaviour, including their tendency to recall only the accurate information and forget the misses, and to elaborate on given material in ways that uh, make the recalled version more specific to them, and therefore more difficult to explain away. To my knowledge, the only attempts to test these assumptions empirically have been by me. Skeptical researchers have been content to apply the method after the fact to given data in a manner that will be scorned if done by parapsychologists. As part of my PhD project, I wanted to test whether general statements recommended by pseudopsychics were successful because they acted as Barnum statements. Barnum statements are statements that most people accept as true of themselves, but importantly don't recognise that they're likely to be tr equally true for other people, and so they regard them as uniquely or especially pertinent. The classic Barnum statements were coined by psychologist Bertrand Forer in 1949 and were derived from a new stand astrology book. They include items like, at times you have serious doubts as to whether you've made the right decision or done the right thing, and disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. To assess whether the statements recommended by pseudopsychics worked in a similar way, I needed to use a standard clinical setting similar to those used in hundreds of published tests of the Barnum effect. So I recruited participants to provide personal validation data on a new way of assessing results from a house tree person test. Oh, I should have skipped to that. So here's the house tree person test. This test, unsurprisingly, 
entailed a participant being given a blank sheet of paper and a set of coloured pens and pencils, and asked to draw freehand a house, a tree, and a person. These drawings would be passed on to an analyst, who would generate a personality description based on their interpretation of the drawing. This description would be given to participants the following week, so they could evaluate the analysis. Of course, everyone received the same um, feedback, which consisted of the pseudopsychic statements, and these showed the same levels of acceptance as Barnum's statements. Because the study contained an element of deception, I took great care during debrief to discuss the experimental design and to ask for their thoughts about participating. I was astonished to discover that quite a few of my participants had been conducting their own experiments within my experiment. <laughs> they hadn't studied the house tree person test before, but suspected that certain features, such as large eyes, large people relative to the size of the house, might have particular meanings, such as a tendency to paranoia uh, to, or grandiosity. And so they'd included these elements to see if they would translate into their feedback. Many reported with satisfaction that they had, even though everyone received the same feedback, demonstrating people's capacity to see what they expect to see. More importantly for my thinking about research in general, I realized that participants might have their own constructions of the experiment that I had designed, and that any pretensions to have produced a consistent set of conditions across all trials was naively optimistic. The interpersonal dynamics between researcher and participants clearly can have a great effect upon the psychological conditions under which the study is conducted, and these in turn can transform the outcomes. This seems especially relevant to parapsychological research, where the phenomena already seem quite sensitive to conditions. To illustrate, I led a project that uh, Ardo mentioned uh, previously over this conference that was intended to tease out the similarities and differences in performance at ESP and PK tasks using a common platform. We developed a greyhound racing game that allowed us to include a condition in which the participant acted as a gambler and simply had to choose which dog they thought would win the, the next race and so we were testing for ESP. In a second condition, they acted as an owner and didn't have any choice over which dog was theirs, and this allowed us to test for PK. Whereas the movements of dogs in the ESP condition was determined by a fixed list of random numbers drawn in advance of the study from tables, and so was potentially available by ESP, movements in the PK condition were determined in real time by reading data from a random number generator, and so potentially was open to psychokinetic influence. In order to control for expectancy effects, we were able to have half the PK trials, in fact, test for ESP, and half the ESP trials, in fact, test for PK. We thought the task was intuitive and engaging, and we're very hopeful it would be effective. Unfortunately, across three formal studies, we found little evidence of overall of ESP or PK, though, as seems usual in parapsychological studies, there were enough secondary effects to suggest we weren't just looking at random noise in the data that we'd collected. For the final study in the series, we speculated that the null results might reflect a kind of experimenter effect. To that point, all the data had been collected by Russell Davey, a graduate research assistant of mine who was a bright and able student, but relatively inexperienced at running parapsychology experiments. In this last study, Davey would again be responsible for the recruitment and scheduling of participants, but this time he would only run half the sessions and the other half would be run by me. I was more experienced and more invested in the goal of the project, having spent a lot of time developing the ideas and securing funding. Again, Russell Davies' participants scored at or below chance expectation, but my participants scored significantly better in the disguised ESP and PK conditions and suggestively better overall. Most intriguingly, Russell and I rated our interaction with the participants after the initial briefing, that is, while each trial was being completed, so that at that time we didn't know anything about the participants' performance. And our confidence of success correlated quite strongly with the outcome, a Spearman's row of minus 0.43, a p-value of 0.007. We took this to suggest that there was some ineffable quality of the interaction between the experimenter and participant that cued us as to the trial's likely success, although clearly this wasn't something we could recognize and manipulate to ensure successes in subsequent trials. We've since conducted similar studies at Northampton to look for experimental participant interaction effects in Dream ESP, Gansfeld, and PMIR studies. And although the findings are as yet equivocal, there are some grounds for optimism, particularly when looking at fluctuations of experimental mood and expectations of success as predictors of performance. This reaffirms my suspicion that despite our best efforts, there are lots of ways in which one trial differs from another, even where superficially we're keeping conditions constant. This brings to mind Heraclitus' famous observation, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and it's not the same man. In the, same, in the wake of the latest crisis in psychology, 
brought about by the Open Science Collaboration's failure to replicate. Um, more than 36% of findings originally reported in high caliber journals. It's useful to consider whether it might be unrealistic to expect replication success to simply be a function of effect size and study power, as it might be in the natural sciences, since here we're working with subtle interpersonal factors and drawing on tacit knowledge. If you're interested, I talk more about this in the latest issue of Minefield, so a quick plug there. In my experimental work, I prided myself that my designs were reasonably sophisticated. I did a good job in controlling for extraneous variables so that significant outcomes, where there, where there were any, could be more unambiguously attributed to the manipulation. But in the efforts to contrive an experiment with elaborate controls, had I lost sight of how the work linked with people's everyday lived experience? This lesson was driven home for me by Tony Lawrence, who confessed during a talk at the Conference of the Society for Psychical Research about his sense of embarrassment when in social situations he met people who heard of his interest in parapsychology and volunteered accounts of rich and vivid psychic experiences or abilities of their own. He recognized that this sense of embarrassment reflected his shortcoming, not theirs. He was comfortable with psi as an abstract construct and even with the occurrence of psi in experiments, so long as it was strong enough to produce significance levels that encouraged further research, but not so strong that it challenged one's worldview. When he met people for whom Psy was sufficiently rich to be an integral part of their sense of self and of their everyday lives, he found that he had nothing to say to them because his research didn't speak directly to their experience. That way of thinking about and managing research was clearly dysfunctional. As a psychologist, what I do in the refined conditions of experimental work must generate discoveries that speak to people's lived experiences of Psy. And for that to happen, it must be founded on those lived experiences. A case in point is telephone telepathy. Rupert Sheldrake has argued that telephone telepathy is among the most common types of spontaneous experience reported by the general public, based on surveys that pose the question, have you ever heard the telephone ring or picked up the telephone and known who was on the other end without any possible cue before they've spoken? Such experiences are dismissed by the skeptically minded as reflecting the attribution of meaning to simple coincidence, implicit learning of behavior patterns that might suggest when certain people are likely to call, and selective recall of confirmations and forgetting of disconfirmations. All of these are plausible given our susceptibility to, to such errors. To control for these explanations, Sheldrake has developed a simple protocol in which potential callers, such as the Nolan sisters in this picture, uh, a singing group from the 1980s and 90s, uh, are separated from the callee, and one is chosen at random to make each call. The callee makes their guess once the phone rings, but before they pick up the receiver and their likelihood of success just by chance should be in proportion to the number of potential callers. Sheldrake has had some success with this uh, protocol, and it's an attractive way to introduce some of the principles of the scientific method to the general public. But I can't help feeling that he's missed the point of telephone telepathy in his rush to the laboratory. And this may account for some of the difficulties that others have had in replicating. J.B. Ryan had some pertinent advice to those who hope to study Psy in the laboratory. If you want to have rabbit stew, you first have to catch a rabbit. And if we want to catch the rabbit, then we need to know something of its behavior and preferences in its natural environment, or else we'll be constantly chasing its tail. In other words, if we aim to study the action of sight in the laboratory, we need to ensure that we have an intimate understanding of it in situ, that the laboratory situation reflects circumstances under which Psy will ordinarily appear. With only the most meager sketching of the phenomenon of telephone telepathy as it occurs, uh, in that natural environment, there's a real danger that skeptical accounts will fit insofar as one vague thing can be mapped onto another vague thing, and difficulties in replicating will arise because we've developed no real understanding of the necessary or sufficient conditions for its occurrence. In this context, I thought it important to ask people about the circumstances of their telephone telepathy experiences and of how they made sense of them. We conducted focus groups of people who had such experiences and we thematically analyzed their discussions. Among the themes to emerge were that there were often palpable emotional or physical changes during the experience that signaled to them that this wasn't simply a coincidence. And by dint of these experiences, they thought that women were more likely to have the experience on the basis that they were more trusting of their emotional responses. Also, that the experiences usually were an expression of a sense of connection with particular people. That is, the telephone telepathy experience was a verification of something they knew by other means. And most importantly, they saw the experiences as a minor subclass of phenomena that formed part of a cluster of experiences that confirmed to them that they were interconnected spiritual beings. They wanted to talk about instances of telephone telepathy in which they were the caller, 
rather than the callee on occasions when they felt a growing sense of foreboding or concern for someone close to them whom they felt compelled to call and who turned out to be in trouble or unwell. And this, when it happened, was an affirmation of their bond and obligation to each other. They wanted to relate other experiences that they interpreted in terms of their lives, forming part of some cosmic design or being benignly watched over. In that context, the experiences, um, the telephone telepathy experiences themselves were seen as trivial and attempts to reproduce them in formal experiments seemed facetious. In an effort to overcome this kind of embarrassment that Tony Lawrence has described, I began seeking opportunity to spend time with practitioners, including healers who were part of the Confederation of Healing Organizations in the UK, but especially mediums who were members of the Spiritualist National Union. Along with my colleague Elizabeth Roxburgh, I attended church services with platform demonstrations, participated in development workshops, and talked with practitioners off the record about their abilities, how they experienced them, and importantly, how they managed them. Qualitative methods have been quite alien to me, given my background in the natural sciences and my research record over the first 15 years, which consisted almost exclusively of experimental work. However, it became clear that some phenomena, for some phenomena rather, qualitative methods were a better fit for the rich, idiosyncratic, nuanced nature of parapsychological experience. They also appealed in privileging the experience rather than the researcher as expert concerning their own experience which I saw as an expression of the humility that I'd always thought should be at the heart of empirical inquiry. Our primary research focused on well-being. Mediums report experiences that in other circumstances could lead to diagnosis of pathology. They see things that other people cannot see, hear things that others cannot hear, have embodied experience that they attribute to the influence of discarnate others. And yet, they present as more psychologically healthy than spiritualists who don't have these experiences and in fact, also better than norms for the general public. Elizabeth and I explored this paradox in interviews with practitioners, asking them about their life history, about their practices, and the experiences that they're led to. Many reported seeing apparitions in childhood, and the reaction of significant others to these was key in determining how the experiences were processed and assimilated. It was important for them to be part of a community that not only accepted their experiences, but valued them. They needed to have an interpretative framework that made sense of the experiences, gave them sense or order, and importantly, access to ways of working with spirit communicators that made their experiences manageable and not simply an indicator of psychosis. Thus, the voices they heard, they heard weren't unwanted intrusions, but were collaborators who could be negotiated with and whose time could be rationed so that they were able to have uninterrupted time to do mundane things so long as they agreed to spend time with spirit. Some of these concerns are nicely illustrated in Sarah's account. I apologize for the length of this quote, but it's very difficult to see how to cut it. I'll read it out if you uh, don't fancy reading it for yourself. The first memory that I actually have was hearing voices after my father died. One night I went to bed and I woke up and I'd had these voices talking to me, saying that my dad was fine, he was living, there wasn't a problem. He wouldn't want me to be upset and I thought I was dreaming. So I thought, pull yourself together. And as I turned over to go back to sleep, the voices were still there, so I thought, I'm losing it. I'll go down and make a cup of tea. This is an English person, and making a cup of tea is a solution for most things. <laughs> so I went down, and all the while I was making the cup of tea, these voices were still talking to me. So I went to the doctors, and I told him what had happened. I said, I must be having a nervous breakdown. So he gave me some pills, as they do, told me to go away for a few days and just try and chill and relax. I never took the pills because I don't take tablets. I don't believe in that sort of thing. I thought, right, this is me, and now I need to cure myself to get better. So I just pulled myself together. I blocked absolutely everything out. I thought, I've really just got to get back on track. And I did that probably for six or seven years, just suppressing these experiences. But then I started to talk to a medium, and we started just chatting about things. And that's when my interest started, because they were explaining things to me, because that was my first real knowledge that somebody was talking to me. Steph and her sister were starting to explain all these things to me and all the little things that had happened over the years, which were just put down as, oh, well, that must be that and that must be that. So, you know, things just started making sense. I found that concerns about pathologization and ridicule are quite widespread. Its consequences were impressed upon me by one experience in supervising an undergraduate project some years ago. I was approached by a mature student who wanted to collect new cases of near-death experience. She interviewed one woman, we'll call her Emily, who described an NDE that occurred after complications following childbirth, perhaps 15 years earlier. Her NDE contained classic features, including an out-of-body element, an encounter with lo loving light, and meeting deceased relatives. My student was able to explain that these were typical of many NDE cases, 
and the experience relief in having her experience validated and normalized was palpable. She disclosed that although the experience had happened so long ago, she hadn't shared it with anyone, not her husband, friends or family members, and certainly not any medical professionals, for fear that she would be, quote, packed off to the loony bin. She felt like she'd been carrying a burden for 15 years that had finally been lifted through this encounter with my student. It was clear to me that parapsychology has an obligation to support people like Emily, so that they're reassured that many so-called paranormal experiences are not abnormal, but reflect the normal range of human experience. Our work with mediums has been part of an ongoing initiative to strengthen links between researcher and practitioner communities. When we first approached them, there was an understandable suspicion that our intentions were to prove that they were at best misguided and at worst fraudulent. It has taken time to demonstrate our sincere intentions and to build trust. Our strategy has involved a two-way exchange, attending and running workshops that have enabled us to learn about mediumship, about development and practice, and for practicing mediums to learn from us about the principles of scientific methods and ways that they might be applied to their own experience and their psychic development. This collaboration moved to a higher level in 2014 when we were donated space at Stansted Hall to convert into a permanent on-site research laboratory. The Stansted Hall estate was gifted to the Spiritualist National Union by Arthur Findlay in 1954 with the intention that the buildings be used to establish a college of psychic science. It was renamed the Arthur Findlay College and has established an international reputation for its educational programs in mediumship practice and philosophy. But despite spiritualism being among the most evidence-based of the major religions, these programs have not always sought to engender a scientific approach to the evaluation of empirical evidence gathered during demonstrations. And the establishment of a laboratory is intended to rectify that. So here's the laboratory. Refurbishing the lab space has been made possible by generous support. We have spaces here, just as a quick aside, uh, that afford uh, more qualitative research, so it's much more informal and comfortable. And there's also a laboratory space with some technical apparatus, usually computer-mediated, that allows to measure things like EEG, to run psi experiments of various sorts, and hopefully to, for example, replicate um, Arno's recent study. So that's kind of the plan there. Refurbishing the lab space has been made possible by generous support from the Society for Psychical Research friends of Stansted Hall and local spiritualist groups, showing that this is a genuine collaboration. These donations have enabled us to create a facility that will be made available to serious researchers across the country uh, to work closely with a broad spectrum of practicing mediums who visit the AFC. The monetary investment is quite modest, but hopefully will have a significant impact on the amount of serious research with mediums that can take place in the UK. Speaking of investments, I'd like to acknowledge that all the work that I've just described has been made possible by the generous support of a variety of funders to whom I'm extremely grateful. But it's clear to me that the marginal status of parapsychology has made accessing funding much more difficult than for other more mainstream uh, topics. And I think this has had consequences for the kind of research that we see. Firstly, because there's very little money to go around, relatively few people can be fully employed in research. The actual community of active researchers is remarkably small. So very little new research is conducted each year barely enough to make publication in our journals as competitive as it should be. And those people who attract funding, the most of that funding, tend to be innovators who have been successful in developing new protocols or adapting methods from other areas and in demonstrating proof of principle by reporting significant side effects using those methods. We, have a, a number of, we also have a number of early adopters who are quick to seize on new approaches and technologies and are responsible for the first wave of independent replications. However, Relatively quickly, the innovators lose interest in simple confirmations and move on to develop yet another uh, method or approach, and the early adopters soon follow suit. I'm sure that this pattern also occurs in other disciplines, but with their greater numbers, they also include many able technicians who are willing to conduct modest replication extensions that allow them to do research in order to pay the mortgage. I suspect that parapsychology cannot afford many able technicians, so their interest in an original protocol or effect seems to wane, and as the caravan moves on. This gives parapsychology the appearance of a butterfly science that flits en masse from protocol to protocol as they fall in and out of fashion, much as a butterfly flits from flower to flower. At best, this is frustrating in diverting resources away from potentially fruitful avenues of research, but at worst, it looks suspicious to the outsider who expects to see continuing and systematic work using a particular method for as long as it's productive, particularly where great claims have been initially made for it. Why are there now so few micro-PK studies, so few Gansfeld studies in parapsychology? 
Has Hyman's prediction of an as yet undiscovered flaw been fulfilled and hushed up by the community? As a community, we need to better coordinate our efforts to give rise to a more systematic and enduring program of research, one that goes beyond proof of principle and first wave independent replications, so we can build a critical mass of data. The excellent BEM replications are a notable example of what can be achieved when this, this is happening. Secondly, I think hyper-competition for funding makes, it, makes us need to be creative in order to get best value for money. It's a simple fact that as a senior academic at my university, I'm simply too expensive these days to be employed directly doing research. The support of the Parrot Work Fund is a notable exception to that. Instead, I've tried to invest the resources I've accrued in young researchers. Professional development for those interested in a career in parapsychology is still extremely difficult in the UK, with very limited funds available to support one's way through advanced qualifications like MSc and PhD that are necessary prerequisites to university employment. It seems inevitable that we're losing very talented individuals who simply cannot afford to opt for parapsychology when other branches of psychology, for example, can offer bursaries to defray living expenses, etc. Employing a bright student to collaborate on a project, ostensibly as a research assistant, but in practice as a co-experimenter who contributes to all stages of the research cycle, from design to conference presentation and even journal publication, can be just the boost needed to maintain their commitment to parapsychology during those times of adversity. Beneficiaries of this approach at Northampton include people who've since received their doctorate, doctorates, people like Nicola Holt, Sophie Drennan, and Glenn Hitchman, and people currently um, working on their PhDs, such as Charmaine Sonex, Callum Cooper, and Andrew Hodrian. These are names that may be familiar to you, or they will be in the years to come. And this leads to my final, uh, my final reflection. During my involvement with the PA as a board member and more recently as president, I've consistently pushed for us to do more to nurture young talent by providing opportunities for them to develop professionally so that they can be successful members of the academic community. I still believe that we will gain a, a foothold not by persuading established researchers to become involved in parapsychology, but by seeding the next generation with people who have direct experience of its rigor and caution and are more open to consider the implications of its findings. That's why I think Bob Morris's strategy during his time as Kersler Professor has been so important to the field and why I think it's essential for us to continue in his stead. When he was first appointed to the Edinburgh chair, he confided that he intended to take the long view with this post, investing the time and effort to build good relations with other academic disciplines and develop a quality program that could generate excellent scholars who would then go on to take up academic posts at other universities, seeding the intellectual landscape of Britain and Europe with parapsychological experts in a way that had not yet proven possible in the US. How successful has Bob been? By my count, he was able to mentor 26 graduate students to receive their PhDs, many of whom are still very active in parapsychology, having been able to establish themselves in academia, um, in, in university departments or private facilities. Of these, six have supervised or are supervising their own PhD students, adding another generation to the family tree, um, making another generation to the family tree. And among that generation, four are themselves supervising PhD students, making 26 grandchildren of Bob's and a further nine great-grandchildren. There they are. By the standards of mainstream psychology, this family tree is unexceptional. But in terms of ensuring the viability of parapsychology in human resources terms, I think it makes a crucial contribution to the size and caliber of our research community around the UK. And this is the UK... Uh, population pretty much at the moment, where, where the main centres are. We need, a, we need to find a way of replicating this in other countries. At a more local level, such mentoring can also contribute to the vibrancy of the research culture. I'm a great believer in the importance of critical mass, having seen its consequences for myself. When I first joined the University of Northampton in 1995, I had colleagues who were supportive of my work, but knew little about it and were not interested in becoming more involved. As an isolated academic, progress was very slow. Things picked up when Christine Simmons Moore joined me to start her PhD, and suddenly I had a knowledgeable person to bounce ideas with and hatch research plans. A task shared is a task halved. Slowly we've been able to draw more people to us, so that today Northampton is one of the largest research groups devoted to parapsychology and transpersonal psychology around uh, the world, certainly in the UK. And the diversity of interests and approaches ensures that each day with them is surprising and rewarding. I want to end this talk by thanking them for their energy and enthusiasm and for ensuring that I'm just as excited about research in parapsychology today 
as I was 25 years ago. Thank you. We have some time for question. I noticed uh, in your discussion of uh, mediums and qualitative research that you mentioned that they're in danger of pathological diagnoses because they see things other people don't see and so forth. Um, now, personally, um, I've been noticing most of my adult life that we have, almost all of us, individual differences in sensoria. And I'm talking about here just the normal mundane senses that everybody acknowledges exists. Uh, if I can be pardoned for uh, using somebody that I long sat next to as an example, I learned fairly quickly at Pear that Roger has a much more acute sense of smell than I have, and I have a much more acute sense of hearing than he does. Uh, at the same time, most people don't seem to pay attention to that sort of differentiation between individuals in the normal senses. My awareness of that is one reason I've always been provisionally ready to accept differential sensitivity in peculiar senses or unique senses such as mediums seem to display. Um, do you think there's some leverage that we might get by trying to get more general awareness of differences in sensory acuity to try to make people less frightened of folks who see things that they don't? I think it depends on the community that you're talking to. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking firstly about my own um, rather impoverished uh, social perception skills. I can go to a party and not realize that one person has fallen out with another when my other half recognizes that straight away. Um, but also, I was thinking of Gordon Claridge's work on schizotypy and the idea that what we have is something that is dimensional, that it falls along an array, that some people um, have more of a particular type of experience or are more open to certain kinds of experience than others. So certainly in some communities that is the case. But I know from our research, uh, working with clients in psychotherapy, uh, visiting the whole range from psychotherapists uh, to um, clinical psychologists, for example, and psychiatrists, that there's a great range in the responses that you get from those people and the likelihood that those people will pathologize certain classes of experience in a very black and white kind of way. Even if uh, mental health professionals didn't show that variation, their clients perceive that they will be treated in that way. And I think that's our problem, is to break down that perception in the general public. As I've mentioned in the talk, I think clinical parapsychology is going to be extremely important for us in the future going forward in educating academics, mental health professionals about the nature of these phenomena and, as you say, how normally distribu distributed many of them are. So I think that's important. Um, thank you, Chris. This looks like, it's like, I want to be there. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, if what is normally in society called healthy mentally is actually not healthy, is actually, if there's some higher level of health that we could aspire to um, than what we normally see in the public realm, um, is that important to bring into a sphere where you're doing this kind of work? Uh, is, is, and you know, it seems like this is a community that has the capability to, to delve into these extra levels of healing like we heard yesterday. And would that be a useful adjunct and are you already finding that that tends to be engaged by people who are uh, taking on this work? Absolutely. We, we found at Northampton that that is one of our main levers is to work through mental health and well-being. That what we have are a class of experiences that people find troubling because they can't get accurate information about what it means, and what sense to make of them, and that we can provide that kind of a support. We also have access to a wide range of spiritual practices that in themselves you know, have a positive impact on well-being. And so I think that is certainly a role that we can play. As we see with the secularization of mindfulness practices, it may be that what we need to start with is the dividend to show that actually engaging with particular phenomena or experiences is the starting point because there are realizable benefits for the well-being and the, the wealth of a community. 
And then secondarily, we need to consider then the uh, conceptual aspects, the assumptions that underpin those practices and beliefs. So that, that might be the way forward. Yeah, and so you're doing that within the research team too? Uh, paying absolutely. attention to bringing people up to their highest selves? Well, it, it, I mean, our unit is a very transpersonal unit, so I think we, we do take that into account. Something that I wasn't able to speak about today is, for example, in our um, master's program on transpersonal psychology, it's very important for us that students' dissertations there are truly transpersonal in the sense not only that it's a transpersonal topic and it applies transpersonal methods, but also that it has the potential to transform the researcher as well, that it has that kind of resonance with them. So I, I think... In, in some sense, it's naive, again, to extricate us ourselves from the process and to think that the, this isn't a learning experience or a growth experience. Chris, uh, it's really nice to hear somebody uh, who really believes, still believes in the system, the academic system <laughs> that is working, especially that's working for parapsychology. Um, yeah, w without wishing to do too much way of self-advertising, I think I can say I was the first one to do a PhD in modern times in parapsychology. And I should be really happy with all these uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. But um, the skeptical side of me and also the fact that I, I, I've had a lot of difficulties in working in academia with this background, although I'm a, trained as a clinical psychologist. Um, yeah, I wonder how many of these people are actually working in parapsychology. To be, I, I'm sorry to be a little pessimistic, but uh, I, I think the picture isn't quite as rosy as you've uh, you okay. painted here. It would be nice if it was, right. but uh, I think there are major difficulties. You have had a unique position, I think, at Northampton. When it was first established um, and we lo lost the Kerstler chair, people said, nobody's heard of Northampton. This is hopeless. But... Um, you've really done a great work with all these, these students. And, but I think you've had a unique position being supported by your university, and I think that's very unusual. I, I wouldn't overplay the university support aspect. I think they like to see money coming in and research outputs going out, and maybe they're less concerned about the subject matter. But I've, I've still had to work pretty hard to, to get where I am today, so to speak. Um, I... I I would say that from my perspective, every single student on that board, the three folks on the left, they're supervisors of projects. They're, they're not necessarily um, engaged in research directly. Um, all of them I would class as parapsychology. But I've got quite a liberal uh, view. I don't see parapsychology as being restricted to the experimental component. It's not necessarily about demonstrating uh, features of psi per se. It's about the rounded experience of people. Um, so that, that may be a, a point where we differ. <coughs> Chris, thank you for being our president.